Nothing makes me happier than going into a Starbucks and seeing them sell salami and cheese in a prepackaged, you know, like, Eat. my God, they're finally getting, people are finally <laughs> getting the protein. Or the eggs. You know, or the <laughs> eggs. Yeah, you can go and buy hard-boiled eggs. Right. Oh, my God, at a 7-Eleven? <laughs> what do you mean? I, I don't have to stick to the Slim Jim? You know what I mean? I can actually get an egg or a yogurt or a string cheese? You know, that's, that I love, I love that, that sort of convenience factor that, you know, it used to be convenience for the average Joe. Now, you know, we're getting more convenience for people who mm -hmm. want right. to live better and be healthy. I'm Dr. Jim Stepani, and today I'm gonna to give you the four reasons why you should be intermittent fasting. Now, intermittent fasting refers to periods where you fast followed by periods of feeding. Now, the typical intermittent fasting diet that I follow is called a 16 to eight, where you're basically fasting for 16 hours out of the day and eating for only eight hours. We already do this in our normal day, with our sleep pattern. Most people typically fast about 12 hours and eat about 12 hours. By simply extending that window a few more hours where you're fasting for a full 16 and only eating for eight hours a day, you get many benefits that go far beyond normal diet patterns. To learn how to intermittent fast, make sure you check out my article on intermittent fasting at bodybuilding.com. My name's Christian Loya. I'm 25, I'm from Roy, Utah. So I started training about a year ago. I recently graduated from college. Throughout college, I was working full-time, going to school full-time, and in a sense, didn't have the time or was a little too lazy to go to the gym. So I was looking for something different, something that was kind of technically or science-based, just like me with an engineering degree. And that's when I found the Shortcut to Size program. I got all my stuff ready. I decided I was gonna to go to the gym the next day and I prepared myself mentally for the workout. People were starting to see in the gym, you know, like, hey man, you're starting to get bigger. You're starting to get more ripped. After the 12 weeks, I was 151 pounds, but my arms were big, you know, I felt great. So I felt like I lost a lot of body fat and gained a lot of lean body mass. For any of those that are on the fence of doing shortcut to size, I can tell you from here, it's not gonna be easy. Follow the nutrition and follow the workouts and you will see a transformation. Hey guys, Dr. Jim Stepani here from the bodybuilding.com headquarters gym. I'm doing my workout from my shortcut to, uh, not size, shortcut to strength program today. This is going to be workout number four, also known as day six of the Shortcut to Strength program. This is the power focused workout. Now this is a full body workout. Although the program is not a full body design program, you have a bench day, you have a squat day, you have a deadlift day. The power day is pretty much full body. We're gonna be doing nine exercises, starting with some legs, moving on uh, to chest and then back, and we'll basically pretty much hit each muscle group with light weight and low reps. Now, typically that combination uh, goes the opposite way, heavy weight and low reps. Today we're doing three rep sets. However, the weight that we're gonna be lifting is extremely light, about 50% of your one rep max, but you're stopping at three reps. It doesn't matter about fatigue in this workout. This workout is all about developing explosive power. That means light weight, fast reps, and not going to failure because you're targeting those fast twitch muscle fibers. And to get them to perform with more power and strength, you don't actually want to fatigue them. So the point of this workout is not to feel pumped and exhausted at the end. This is a very athletic style workout. And like I said, it's not designed to fatigue you or create much of a pump. It's all about developing that explosive power. And so we're gonna start with legs. And the first exercise we're gonna do are jump squats. And typically with jump squats, it's very simple. You're gonna use your body weight. Now, a lot of people 
will say, well, what about the overload principle, Jim? You always want to get heavier, right, as you progress. Well, what we have found with power moves, particularly the jump squat, is you're actually better without any additional weight, using just your body weight. Now, there's a couple of reasons. First of all is safety. When you're jumping and landing with a weight on your back, it's not the best thing for your spine. So you have that issue. However, what the research has actually found is because speed is so important in power development, if you go too heavy, you don't develop enough power. And what we have found on the jump squat is body weight is the ideal weight that you want to use. So don't be tempted to add weight when, using, when doing your jump squat. Work on increasing your vertical jump for those few reps. So we're going to do three jump squat reps. And now there's a variety of ways that you can do the jump squat. I prefer to stand with about a shoulder width stance. And when I come down, I come down, I touch the ground, and then I jump up. And then I come down and I reset. And then I go into my next one. Down and reset. You can use a more narrow stance if you prefer. Come down and up. You can go wider if you want. The choice is up to you, but what I would suggest is use a stance that's similar to the stance you use when you do squats. And so, like I said, for me, it's about a shoulder width stance. I'm gonna come down and jump up as high as I can. Now, I had four knee surgeries this past year, so my knee is only at about, oh, 60%, so my vertical is in that great, so, isn't that great, so bear with me. But your goal is to jump as high as you can. Just three reps, take about a minute to two rest in between sets. So that's two sets of three reps. And like I said, it's very easy. You're not gonna be that fatigued, but the point isn't to fatigue those fast twitch muscle fibers, it's to uh, get them to perform at their best with power, uh, explosive power. And like I said, somewhere around the three rep range, not going too much higher to cause fatigue is the ideal rep range. Now I won't rest as long as I would typically recommend, even though you're not fatigued from only doing the three reps, you still wanna give yourself at least a good minute or two of rest, because like I said, the point here is not to fatigue those fast twitch muscle fibers. It's to give them plenty of rest so that they're performing with the most power that they can provide. So you wanna rest a little longer than I'll be demonstrating this workout. But I'm gonna go right into set number three. Now once we're done with the jump squats, we're gonna do another squat exercise. This is gonna be just standard squat. Now here, you're gonna use 50% of your one rep max. I'm only using 135 because like I said, I've had a few knee surgeries this year, so my leg strength uh, is pretty limited. So I'm gonna stick with 135. I'll also note that I may not be able to go down to full parallel uh, because of the limits of my knee. So don't follow me, don't follow my form, but just follow the concept. What we're gonna be doing here is again, three sets of three reps, very fast and very explosive. And what you're gonna do is come down on the negative, slow and controlled, and then explode up on the positive. And then you rack the weight. Again, like I said, you're gonna rest one to two minutes in between sets even though those three reps really aren't gonna fatigue you that much. The point is, again, like I said, this is not a workout to get fatigued. It's not gonna cause a great sweat. You're not gonna get a great pump, but you are gonna get considerably stronger and more powerful.
Now one of the biggest questions I get when I train is why do I train barefoot? So a lot of people are probably wondering now, is that something that I recommend doing? No, not necessarily. I train barefoot for my own biomechanics. I had a motorcycle accident as a teenager and so I've crushed uh, lumbar spine and what I found is that due to the change in my biomechanics, the way that the spine is changed, twists my hips. So I have one hip that's higher than the other. When I'm barefoot, I'm better able to adjust my, my foot position because I have direct contact with the floor. I find when I have shoes on, it sort of numbs my feet, if you will, in being able to adjust and make those small moves uh, that I need to do to be able to perform that movement with my wonky back uh, is a little better with barefoot. Plus, I grew up doing martial arts, so I've been, I'm used to training barefoot. It's just something that's very natural to me. Nothing that I would recommend everyone do unless you find that it's just more ideal for your own biomechanics. So now I'm gonna go into my final set, number three, again, just three reps here. And like I said, you'll notice I go nice and controlled on the negative. It's just the positive that you want to be fast and explosive on. So we have a quite a few questions coming in because yeah. of the giveaway. So um, Matt from Facebook says, hey Jim, with intermittent fasting, do you start counting your fast from the time you stop eating or the time you go to sleep the night before? So I start my fast when I go to sleep, which is pretty much when I end my feeding window. So my last meal is at 12 o'clock uh, p.m. and that's typically right about close to the time that I go to bed. I don't go to bed too much later. But you want it to end on that last meal that you've had. Once you've had that last meal, you can start counting those uh, 16 hours or whatever uh, your fasting window is. Awesome. Uh, Raymond from Twitch says, Jim, how important is rest in between any set? Do muscles need recovery between sets or is it continuous uh, set needed for growth? Great question. So rest periods are an area, well, it's one of the, what we call the acute variables uh, when we're designing a weightlifting program. You have weight, you have exercise, you have exercise order, uh, you have rest periods. Those are a few of the variables that we use to make up a workout. And the rest period typically is designed for the rep range with typically uh, heavier weight uh, requiring more uh, rest periods. However, that's all due to the energy systems uh, that are involved in what you're training. So typically when you're going with higher reps, you're typically training for more endurance, and so shorter rest periods tend to be used with those higher uh, rep ranges, whereas when you get heavier, down into the five, six rep range, uh, then you typically tend to rest longer so that you have more, uh, better recovery between sets. So some of the things that need to recover between, set, between sets have to do with creatine. This is one of the reasons why creatine is such an effective supplement. The reason that creatine works is it provides what's called high energy phosphates. That's basically the energy molecule that your muscle use to contract. And one of the things that has to be replenished between sets are your levels of creatine phosphate. The longer you rest, the more creatine phosphate you have, but also the harder and longer you train, the faster your recovery. And so over time, what you wanna do is adjust your rest periods to challenge uh, your body. Like I said, you're going to get, your body will be able to recover much faster the more training uh, that you do. And so what you want to do is manipulate your rest periods, not just based on the weight. Like I said, most people rest longer during heavy sets and rest shorter during lighter sets. 
However, you should also be doing the same thing even with heavier sets, adjusting your rest time. Some workouts resting longer so that you have better recovery and you can lift more weight. And then some workouts you want to rest less so that recovery may not be uh, completely uh, uh, you know, ready by the next set, but because it's not, you haven't fully recovered, you have more fatigue, and fatigue is one of the main ways that muscles grow. So yes, muscles need recovery, but you also uh, need to push those levels to really maximize muscle growth and strength gains. Awesome, another question from Facebook. What is your best tip for cutting fat while working on gaining strength? So for gaining strength while you're still cutting body fat, the perfect program is really my shortcut to shred, which is great for a uh, great question uh, since we're focusing on the shortcut series. Now my shortcut to shred program, as the name implies, really focuses on fat loss. However, however, it really is designed to maximize strength as well, and what people find with shortcut to strength is due to the cardiac acceleration, which is essentially active recovery, they're actually getting stronger than they ever were. Many people break PRs during shortcut to shred while they're also getting to their lowest percent body fat. So definitely check out my shortcut to shred. Using cardiac acceleration uh, is a great way to both burn fat, use it as active recovery to help enhance your recovery, and improve strength gains. Ryan wants to know, what's the best workout carb to take immediately post-workout with your whey isolate shake? So post-workout, I'll talk about two things, the protein and the carb. So first of all, he says whey isolate shake. You, you, you want to stop focusing on whey, guys. Everyone, listen to me clearly. Whey protein is a, it's a great protein. However, I'm as guilty as any of the other scientists for promoting whey uh, way too much. Back in the early 2000s, when the research on whey and how fast it's digested and its branch chain amino acid content, we all thought that whey protein was the holy grail and that's all that you needed because it's the fastest, right? Well, lo and behold, what the research now shows is that whey proteins Fast digestibility is both its benefit and its downfall. By that, I mean whey spikes muscle protein synthesis right after a workout. However, that protein synthesis falls sharply within an hour. If you take whey with a longer digesting protein with casein, you not only get that quick spike from the whey, but the casein protein maintains that protein synthesis for longer, so you get better muscle growth. Now. That's protein. Carbs post-workout, my recommendation are fast digesting carbs like my post-gym, which is pure dextrose. Now the reason I use dextrose is it has no fructose. No fructose. The problem with fructose is it goes straight to the liver. That means it's a low glycemic index carb. It doesn't spike insulin. And what you want after a workout is a big insulin spike because you want to recover quicker. You want to get glucose into those muscles and they need insulin. You also want to get creatine into those muscles post-workout, which you should be taking, and creatine requires insulin to get into those muscles. You also should be taking carnitine post-workout, and carnitine also needs insulin to get into the muscle. So post-workout, you want a fast digesting carbohydrate, preferably a dextrose or glucose, which is the same thing, fewer, uh, less fructose, uh, as possible. So definitely stick with something like dextrose. One of my favorite uh, recommendations is gummy bears because they they have more dextrose uh, than other candies, less of the fructose, and pixie sticks. Pixie sticks are pure dextrose, absolutely no fructose whatsoever. Awesome. Dylan wants to know, is casein protein actually effective as a bedtime snack? I have read mixed research and I'm not sure if it's actually doing anything for me. So the question is whether you want to take a casein shake at night because when you sleep, let's say you sleep for eight hours, you're essentially fasting for eight hours. Now, for people who are interested in maximizing muscle growth, you really don't want to go too long without eating because you start breaking down muscle tissue to provide a glucose source for the central nervous system, your brain, while you sleep. 
So one way to avoid this is you can either wake up in the middle of the night, some bodybuilders actually set their alarm clocks, or you can take a casein protein shake, like my Pro Gym, which has both whey and casein in it. Now what the casein does is it's a, like I said before, it's a slow digesting protein. So when you consume it, it will last up to about seven hours in the uh, gastric system, your, your stomach and your intestines. And what it does is basically slowly releases amino acids to the bloodstream over the course of several hours. And like I said, while you're sleeping, that means your body is providing an amino acid source from your diet. That way you're not breaking down the muscle tissues for those amino acids that will then be converted into glucose to fuel your brain. So yeah, casein protein is effective. The latest research actually shows that when it's used at night, as opposed to any other time of day, it's far more beneficial for muscle growth. Awesome, let's do one more before you yep. move on to your next exercise. Um, Jim, if we add cardio acceleration to any program, if fat loss is the main goal, and then followed by 20 to 30 minutes steady state cardio after, would it hinder the muscle gains or be beneficial? So the question is, if you're even doing cardio acceleration, should you then do additional steady state if you really want to maximize uh, muscle growth, or is that too much cardio, and would that end up hindering uh, muscle growth? It really depends on the individual. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, in, in doing plenty of work. I'm not one of these trainers who will tell you to be careful of overtraining. Our, our bodies are designed to work all day long. You're not going to overtrain. What you typically end up doing is under eating. So as long as your diet is in check and you're getting ample protein to uh, help continue those muscle gains, then adding the extra cardio won't hinder your muscle gains as long as you're getting plenty of protein. Awesome. Awesome. So now I'm going to get back to the workout. So to recap, we've done the first two exercises out of nine exercises in this full body power focused workout. Remember, we're doing extremely lightweight, about 50% of our one rep max in only three reps. Once you hit three reps, you stop. You're not going uh, to fatigue. So we've done legs. I did the jump squat followed by barbell squat, both fast and explosive. Now I'm basically going to do the same thing for chest. I'm going to start with push-ups. I'm going to do three sets of three reps of power push-ups, and then I'm going to move into the bench press doing three sets of three fast explosive bench press with very light weight. So with the push-up, you're just going to get into a standard push-up push -up position. And you have a couple options here, depending on your strength uh, and power. You can either just do them very fast on the up, or you can explode and come off the ground. Choice is up to you. So I'll count that as three in my first one. Now, if you want to do the explosive reps, but you find that your body weight is a little too much, you can use a bench. When I put my hands on the bench now, I decrease the resistance from my body. And remember, as I was saying, with explosive moves, it's about speed. So if you go too heavy, you won't have the speed necessary to develop that explosive power. So if you find that you just can't really launch yourself off the ground on the push-up, try doing it on the bench. You'll get more of a launch, and like I said, that helps develop better power. But again, you can stick to doing it on the ground. Most people will find that they have far more explosive power when doing it on a bench. So I'll finish the last three here. Remember, you don't want to go this quick. Give yourself a break in between. Let those fast twitch muscle fibers recover before you hit your next set of three. And 
And now I'm gonna move right into the bench press. So again, just like with the squat, we're using light weight. Like I said, about 50% of your one rep. I'm just gonna use 135. It's a demo here so we can move quick without much rest in between. And now I'm a firm believer in using what I call the open grip, which I'll talk about in a minute. But here, just like with the squat, you're gonna come down slow and controlled on the pot and the negative, but explode it up off your chest. And again, stop at three reps. Now, like I said, I use an open grip, meaning my thumbs aren't wrapped around the bar. The thumb is on the same side as my fingers. Is that dangerous? Sure, it can be, but again, it can be dangerous crossing the road uh, if you, you're not careful. You just have to be aware of where the bar is on your hands, and after years of doing it, there's really very little risk. What I find is that with the open grip, because the thumb doesn't come underneath the bar, where the bar sits in the hand is much lower. With the closed grip, the bar sits higher on the fingers and that tends to put stress on the wrist. Now the wrist is another joint. So it's a weaker joint than the elbow and the shoulder and that can limit the strength on the bench press. When you use the open grip, the bar literally sits down at the bottom of your palm. And so when you're pressing through the forearm, the force is coming up directly through the forearm bones into the bar. And so you don't give anything due to the wrist being a weaker uh, joint. And the bar gets pressed right up. You'll also feel uh, more upper pec involvement when you do it this way and you'll feel that it's far uh, safer on the shoulders. You have less stress on the shoulder joint. Uh, but again, what you wanna do is not only use an open grip, you wanna make sure that those elbows are tucked at about 60 degrees from your sides. You don't wanna come out too far to the sides or that's gonna lead you to a greater risk on shoulder injuries. Now again, on the motion here, I'm not doing fast reps that are out of control like this. That's not fast reps. It's only fast on the positive. You still want to control that negative and then explode on the positive. And yes, here it's okay to use the legs as well. In fact, if you watch power lifters, do the bench press, it's completely different from the way a bodybuilder does the bench press. For a power lifter, the bench press is a full body exercise. They, they literally start from the legs. The strength is driven, that power drives through the legs, through the hips, through the torso, and then up the arms. So here, when you're trying to develop that explosive power, it's okay to uh, lift your butt up a bit off the bench and use those legs. So last set of three. And then if we have any more questions, we'll take that before we move on to the next exercise. Any right. questions? Yes. YouTube wants to know how important is glutamine and when should it be taken? So glutamine is an essential amino acid. And what's interesting about glutamine is it's not one of those amino acids like beta alanine that you're gonna get quick results from. You, you may not even feel the results from glutamine. However, that doesn't mean that glutamine is useless. What glutamine is important for is immune function. Now what happens is during a workout, an intense workout, like one of mine, glutamine levels drop. You're using glutamine. You're using up that glutamine. The problem here is that 
your uh, intestines, your digestive system, and your immune system use glutamine as a fuel source. So if the body's levels of glutamine are depleted from a workout, you're more susceptible to getting a cold and flu. So you want to make sure that your glutamine levels are topped off, particularly after a workout. And that's one of the main reasons why I recommend glutamine post workout. It enhances recovery, it keeps the immune system functioning, preventing you from getting sick. Question from Facebook. Ideally, how long after working out and taking post gym should one wait before taking pro gym? So there's no reason to wait to take either one of those products. You can take them at the same time. You can either mix them together, and, and I've made many of the flavors of post-gym and pro-gym, as well as pre-gym and pro-gym, to be compatible so that you can actually mix them uh, together. If you try the orange, the mandarin orange post-gym, mixed with the Tahitian vanilla bean uh, pro-gym, together it makes a creamsicle uh, flavor, and that way you can take both the post-gym and the pro-gym at the same time. There's no reason to wait, and in fact, they're better when they're taken closer together. I've been squatting for a while, but when DOMS occur, I am only sore in my hamstrings. Do you have any tips to help my quad development when it comes to squatting? Yeah, an interesting thing about squats and muscle involvement uh, was discovered in the lab with weight. And what they found was that if you use more than 80% of your one rep max, so somewhere in the six to eight rep range, you use mainly hamstrings during the squat. However, if you go lighter, 70% or less, so I'm talking about 10 to 12 reps and higher, you tend to use more quads. And this is just regular uh, back squats with a barbell. So one trick to use is don't go too heavy. Make sure that you're using a lighter weight and higher rep ranges. Make sure you're getting in some workouts where you're going 15 to even 20 to 30 reps. And then the other trick that you can do is to use front squats uh, in addition to the back squat. With the front squat, it keeps the torso more upright when you're doing the squat. And that means you get less hamstring involvement, more quadriceps involved. Carol from Facebook says, what supplement would you recommend for maximizing fat loss in combination with your workout programs? Well, if you want to maximize uh, fat loss, I would definitely recommend uh, my Shred Gym product. However, if you're trying to maximize fat loss, you still want to focus on muscle building. So if you're not covered with a good protein uh, powder and a pre-workout in a post-workout to help with uh, recovery and exercise performance, jumping right into a fat burner is probably not your best bet. The fat burning is gonna come from the workout and the diet. The fat burner is a very small uh, help to the, to the diet and the nutrition program. You really wanna make sure that you have your protein down and you have those nutrients like creatine, branch chains, beta alanine, to help with your performance during the workout, which means you're gonna have a more intense workout, you're gonna burn more calories, and it's gonna help you get leaner. Once you've got those uh, areas covered in your supplements, then I would worry about the fat burner, but not until you have those other areas covered. Awesome. Twitch wants to know, when it comes to a back arch, how much is too much on bench press? So again, it depends on uh, the style of, of benching that you're doing. With a, with a power lifting uh, move, you're more, if you've noticed, power lifters will come, they'll put their balls of their feet on the ground and they literally will drive right off the bench. So, so the arch can be quite ridiculous and in, in fact, if you've seen um, a few uh, power lifters who have incredible spine flexibility, they do this huge arch where literally the stomach is, is only a few inches below the bar and so it's a very short move and, it, and it's, it's a legal bench press. So 
how much arch is, is really up to you and what you're focused on is on if you're trying to use the bench press to maximize chest development, then you really want to make sure you have very little arch and that it's mainly the pecs that are doing the work. If you're more focused on how big of a bench you can have, then the arch doesn't really matter and it's all about moving bigger weight. Awesome. Lindsay from Facebook says, I think I undereat and I have tried eating more, but I don't have much of an appetite. When I force myself to eat uh, and I'm not hungry, I get sick. Are there any tips you have to be able to maintain muscle and progress for people like me? Yeah, well, first thing I would recommend is to focus on protein. A lot of times uh, with our diet, we get, we'll, we'll get full on carb sources. And a lot of people think that they need tons of carbs to maximize muscle growth. If that's your case, what I would recommend doing is making sure you're focusing on protein and getting at least 1.5 grams of protein per pound of body weight. So let's say you're 100 pounds, you would basically, uh, if you're 100 pounds, you would basically be eating 150 grams uh, of protein per day. So make sure that you're getting your protein allotment for that day, then focus on fat. Fat is the other macronutrient that is critical uh, for muscle growth and has really been demonized wrongly. Uh, and so people tend to be afraid of consuming fat uh, when they really shouldn't be. What we should be doing is eating far more protein and fat in fewer carbs. And when you focus on those two macronutrients, the protein and the fat, then you'll be, you'll, you'll be getting in plenty of those essential nutrients, the essential amino acids, the essential fatty acids that you need. And then you could focus on the carbs based on what your appetite is. Another uh, trick uh, that a lot of teenagers uh, I'll recommend uh, do is to use like a, a mass gainer shake. Like uh, I have my mass gym that's coming out uh, any day now. Very soon mass gym will be out. And what I typically recommend is using that along uh, with meals. So with your meal, you're also getting your mass gaining shake, which is providing you quality protein, quality fat, and quality carb source. So those are two ways that you can go about trying to include more overall calories, but particularly more of the protein and the fat that's going to be essential for muscle growth. All right, so now we're getting back to the workout. I've done my legs with jump squats and uh, power squats. I've done upper body chest with power push-ups and uh, the power bench press. Now I'm gonna go into uh, dumbbell presses for shoulder. And so these are basically uh, push presses, uh, if you will, or a standing shoulder press. And so again, we're doing three sets of three. And here, like I said, the goal is not maximizing the shoulder development, it's maximizing that power development that the shoulders can provide. And so here, what we actually want to do is we want to use the legs. So with the standing shoulder press, like I said, it's more of a push press. So you can rest the dumbbells on your shoulders. And then what you're going to do is do a little dip and then press up as your legs are coming up. So your legs will initiate the momentum and then you follow with the shoulders. And that's called a push press. And that's the best way to develop shoulder power. So again, three sets of three, about somewhere around 50% of your one rep max. You can play around uh, with those percentages as well, trying a little lighter and even a little heavier, depending on the exercise. Again, don't mimic my rest periods here. You want to rest a bit longer than I'm doing. I just don't want to bore you guys standing around resting. So set two push presses. And one more of those. And then we'll move into 
triceps. We're gonna do close grip bench press. So we'll be right back on the bench. I'll just use the same weight. All right, three sets of three inch shoulders. Now I'm gonna go right into close grip bench press. I'll keep the weight the same. Typically you can use less on the close grip than you can on the bench press, but I, I demonstrated the regular bench press with only 135, so I'll do the same with the close grip. And now it's the same concept here. Slow and controlled on the negative, fast and explosive on the positive. Same thing, I use an open grip, and I'll talk about grip width in a minute as well. Now grip width on a close grip bench press. What the research actually shows is that you'll see a lot of people doing what we call the thumb touch. So they do their close grip, they bring their hands to where their thumbs touch, and then they do their close grip. And, and the concept here is the closer you go, the more tricep involvement you get, which is wrong. Research shows once you've gone to shoulder width, any closer on the bar does not involve any more tricep muscle activity. All it does is increase the tension stress on the wrist. And so you're better off sticking with, like I said, a shoulder with grip on the close grip bench press because you're already maximizing tricep involvement and you're reducing stress on the wrist, which makes for a heavier lift. Again, three sets of three. Like I said, make sure you give yourself uh, ample rest. I'm just gonna jump right into my third one here. And then if we have any more questions, we'll take a little break. So we're down one, two, three, six exercises, three left to go. Legs, chest, shoulders, and now triceps. Awesome. Question from YouTube from Aaron. How safe or how much creatine is safe to take? Well, we definitely know that 40 grams of creatine monohydrate, at least, which is used for loading phase is very safe. Do you need to go that high daily? No. The thing about creatine is that creatine needs to reach a certain level in muscles before it provides any benefit. So you need to make sure you're getting enough. If you're taking an inadequate dose of creatine, it's not gonna give you a little bit of results. It's gonna give you no results. A little bit of creatine is basically zero creatine because it takes dosing over weeks and weeks to reach a certain level in the muscle before it can be effective. And so if your dose is inadequate, your muscles are never gonna reach the level that they need to reach before they start seeing performance benefits. And so that creatine is gonna do absolutely nothing. So the question then is, well, how much then is too much? Like I said, we know that 40, even 50, grams a day of creatine monohydrate uh, is safe uh, and effective. But again, that's a ridiculous amount to take. My recommendation on creatine, and it's based on the form, is if you're using creatine monohydrate, you wanna get right around five grams, both pre-workout 
in post-workout. So about 10 grams a day of creatine monohydrate. If you're using something like creatine hydrochloride or even uh, crealkaline, which is the buffered form uh, of creatine, those two forms of creatine are absorbed more readily than creatine monohydrate, meaning you need far less. And so with both of those, you only need about one and a half to two grams before and after workouts, or somewhere around three to four grams total per day. So really, that is all that you need uh, for creatine. Like I said, 10 grams a day monohydrate, three to four grams a day with either the hydrochloride form or the buffered cryalkaline form. Awesome. Matt from Facebook wants to know, how many different supplements would be too many to be taking? Do you have any recommendation on what someone at a beginner slash intermediate level should be taking? So it's an interesting question. Um, I, I honestly don't think that I've, it's ever been uh, presented to me that way. How many supplements are too much? Um, it, you know, it sounds like you're a beginner. So what I would say is I wouldn't worry about too much. What I would be worried about is what do you really need uh, as a beginner? And I, and I kind of hinted on that when I talked about the question about the fat burner. A, a beginner probably doesn't need a test booster, probably doesn't need a fat burner. Um, you know, probably doesn't need any specialty supplements. What you really need, first of all, is a solid protein source. Now, again, with uh, protein powders like ProGym, what the benefit here is, is you're getting the most anabolic protein sources. You're getting dairy, which is whey and casein, along with egg. That blend is ideal for muscle growth. If you were eating, let's say, chicken, around workouts instead of protein powder, the time it takes to digest that chicken and get to your muscles is gonna to be too slow to really provide uh, a true benefit, that this is the real benefit of the protein powder and why you really wanna focus on protein powder, even as, a, even as a beginner. That being said, you need whey and casein. So if you don't wanna spend the money in the protein powder, you could get it from dairy using milk, using uh, Greek yogurt, skier, uh, cottage cheese. But again, you're gonna be getting a lot of carbs uh, and fat along with that dairy to get the ample amount of protein. But you can't, however, it's just much easier doing it with a protein powder. After protein, then you wanna start considering things like creatine, beta alanine, and branched chain amino acids, which are gonna enhance your workout performance and uh, your recovery. So I would start, like I said, as a beginner, look for a solid protein powder blend that has both whey and casein at the minimum, and then start looking into uh, creatine and beta alanine, uh, as well as branched chain amino acid supplements for both pre and post workout. Awesome. Um, comment from YouTube I'm about to finish the shortcut to strength program. I gained about five pounds. Would I lose some of my strength? strength gains if I did the shortcut to shred rather than any other strength-based program? Absolutely not. In fact, you will probably continue uh, making strength gains. Like I mentioned before, I don't know if you were, were here in the live uh, session when I was talking about the shortcut series, but shortcut to shred, don't let the name fool you. It's really a strength program. And if you go and read some of the reviews of people who've completed, you'll, you'll see, like I said, they are breaking their PRs on exercises like the deadlift while they're doing cardio in between their sets. And it's due to the fact that it's active recovery. It's actually enhancing your recovery during those sets. Now, when you first start the program, it'll zap you. It'll, it'll kill you. You, the first week or two, you'll be like, damn, that cardiac acceleration. I don't feel as strong as I normally am because I'm running and doing step ups in between my bench press and my squat. Two weeks into the program, suddenly the cardiac acceleration is no longer a huge fatigue and now it actually turns into active recovery and is actually enhancing your ability to recover between those sets because what it does is it keeps blood flow moving through the body and that blood flow is bringing more 
oxygen, more nutrients to the muscle, and it's taking more of the waste products away from the muscle. So it's actually helping you recover in between sets. So if you jump from shortcut to strength to shortcut to shred, I would bet that you'll continue gaining more strength. Awesome, we'll take one more from Facebook before we move on. Uh, Jody from Facebook says, hey Jim, when are you gonna put out a protein bar? Good question. So I've actually been working on a protein bar uh, probably a couple of years now. The problem with uh, protein bars is that I won't release it until it's A, absolutely delicious, and uh, B, meets my macro requirements. And I mean my real macro requirements. You know, problems with, with the bar industry over the last few decades has really been about truth in nutrition labeling. And many bars have been busted for uh, you know, false claims on how much fiber and the carbs and the protein. I've been working for the last two years on a true, true low carb uh, protein bar that's not filled with lies and promises about what the carb source is, but a true low carb, amazing tasting protein bar. So just give me time and I will definitely have a pro gym bar to you very soon. All right, so the last three we're gonna do are, we've got the deadlift, and I'll just come right over here to the platform. So same concept here, three sets of three reps. You wanna do these explosive on the positive, but you wanna control the negative. Don't just be lifting it and dropping it, and lifting it and dropping it. Explode on the way up. So what we're gonna be doing here is I'm gonna drive through the heels as I lift the bar up, but then I'm gonna return it nice and slow and controlled and then explode, literally pushing my heels through the ground as I pull the bar up. So three sets of three. And again, like I said, you wanna use about 50% of your one rep max, no, this, isn't really 50% of my uh, one rep max, but again, I've got the knee limit. So I'm gonna stick with the 135. And again, don't mimic my rest periods here. I'm just trying to condense this workout for you guys. Now, one thing I'm gonna say about the deadlift is you'll notice in the top position how far back I lean. And that has to do, again, with the motorcycle accident in my back. Now, you'll see a lot of people comment and say, oh, that's dangerous to lean back. No, it's not dangerous at all to lean back. What's dangerous for the spine is to lean forward under a load. That's where you're gonna pinch a nerve, pinch a disc, and cause real issues. You can extend as far back as you want with as much weight as you want and your spine is not at a compromised position whatsoever. And so what I, the reason I do this is because, like I said, I have back issues. So if I come up and I'm standing here, my center of gravity is more forward and that's putting stress on my back. When I lean back, now my center of gravity is back and the stress is taken off my back. Plus, I'm using more glutes in this position, more hamstring to pull it back. And so it really helps to focus on those muscle groups that you're using. And then the other thing I'll say about the deadlift is the grip. You have a few choices. I tend to use a, what's known as a staggered grip, meaning one hand is over, one hand is under. It tends to be a stronger grip because what happens is you, you're turning the bar this way and this way in the hand, and that prevents it from slipping out. Whereas if you have it both over hands, it can slip out of the hands. One problem here though is it can 
compromise the forearm. When you're lifting heavy weight with an underhand grip, there have been reports of people uh, you know, putting a lot of stress on the forearm, tearing the forearm with the underhand grip. So if you have any forearm issues, you might want to stick with the overhand grip. The other question I get asked a lot is about straps, wrist straps on deadlifts. Now obviously we don't need them today because we're using very light weight and very low reps. But if you're doing, let's say high rep deadlifts, you don't want your grip to be the limiting factor when you put the weight down. If, if that happens, if your grip fatigues before your legs do, your glutes do in your lower back, then you really didn't uh, adequately stress the lower body and you ended that set way too early. So don't limit your deadlift strength because of your grip strength. So if you can't, uh, you know, if your grip strength is weak and you can't, you're going too heavy to lift the weight, feel free to use wrist straps. If you're going heavy or light weight but high reps and you know your, your grip is gonna fatigue, use wrist straps. You don't need to build your grip strength and your forearm size on your deadlift. It's for the legs and for the back. You leave the forearm and grip training to forearm and grip training. If you need wrist straps on deadlifts, feel free to use them, unless of course you're a competitive power lifter because you won't be able to use them in competition. So I'll do the last set here of three. So three sets of three on deadlifts. Now we're gonna go into bent over rows with dumbbells. You could also do this with barbell. The reason I like the dumbbells is the range of motion that it allows. If I'm using a barbell, The range of motion stops when the bar hits my stomach. With dumbbells, I can go much higher, more range of motion. I'm using more lat muscle fibers. And because I'm using explosive movement, I want that weight to be able to move as high as possible. I don't want it to be limited by my own body. So I prefer using the dumbbells so that I have that freedom uh, to, to really bring my elbows up with that explosive power. And again, like with the push press here, you wanna use those legs to initiate that momentum. There's no such thing as cheating when it comes to uh, explosive reps. You want to use those other muscle groups to get that momentum going. It's all about moving that weight fast and explosive. So you're going to bring the weight all the way down to the ground, use your legs and then your arms to pull up that weight after the legs have initiated that movement off the ground. <sighs> Now, like with the bench press on rows, I use an open grip. Same with pull downs, seated rows, barbell rows. And the reason is muscle activity and the mind-muscle connection. When you grab a bar or a dumbbell and you use a closed grip, what happens is you grip that bar and you tend to use your arms to lift the weight. With an open grip, the weight is now just hanging in your arm. Your hand is literally a hook. And so now what happens is you initiate that movement not from the arm, but from the lats because the weight is just hanging from the hook, which is your hand. So it helps to focus more on the lats, whether you're doing pull downs, like I said, 
dumbbell rows, barbell rows, or even seated rows. Give it a try. You'll be amazed at what that simple movement of the thumb can do for your lat involvement. Three sets of three, that's two. I'll do one more. And again, I'm gonna jump right into it. Speed this up. All right, last exercise, our crunches. Do we have any questions to take before? Um, Jim from Facebook says, Shred Jim says take once per day, yet most meal plans show two doses. I typically, I typically take it twice a day. Is that okay on a daily basis? Yes. The problem with the recommendation in the bottle is there's regulations as far as what uh, some retailers allow, like GNC, for example. Uh, they only allow so much caffeine and so much synephrine. I don't agree with that because both are safe and effective, but because of that, I had to change the dosing instructions to just once a day on the bottle. That doesn't make, mean I recommend taking it only once a day. That's just what I'm limited to saying uh, publicly. I recommend taking it two to three times a day, as you'll see, uh, in most of my meal plans, because that's the more effective way to get the results. All right, interesting question from Christian. Jim, do you have any sponsored athletes? Why or why not? Very interesting question. So uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking about Jim Supplement Science and sponsored athletes. Well, the only athlete is really me. Uh, I'm the scientist, uh, I'm the athlete, I'm pretty much everything to the brand. So that's really the reason why we don't sponsor athletes is because I'm really the athlete of the brand. And I never want to pay someone to say that they use my supplement simply because I pay them. I want people and athletes to use the supplement because they truly believe it's the best supplement to take. One more comment before we move on. Uh, CJ from Facebook says, I've been following Jim Stepani's programs and fitness advice for the last two years, and he has been so influential in my physical and mental health more than he'll ever know. Well, thank it's just you. like a nice comment. Awesome. Well, yeah. I really appreciate it. And I never, ever get tired of hearing that. So if you see me out on the street, please stop by and say hi. Like I said, this is why, that's exactly why I do what I do, and uh, it, I never ever tire of hearing it. So thanks for sharing that, and congratulations. Keep up the great work. Last exercise, we're gonna do three sets of simply crunches. Now here we're gonna do more than three. We're gonna do 10 uh, sets, or we're gonna do, sorry, three sets of 10 reps. Now what's really interesting about crunches and, and speed is most people, when they do their crunches, think that the best way to do them is slow and controlled, right? And the crunch is a very short movement. You're literally just bringing your upper back and shoulders off the ground. And one of the things I like to recommend on crunches is you wanna focus on more of the vertical movement, bringing the shoulders and back up versus horizontal movement, bringing your head, if you will, towards your knees. Don't focus on this, focus on trying to come up as high as you can. That's a crunch. It's mainly focusing on those upper abs. It's a very small move. What's interesting is that if you think this is the best way to do the crunch, it's really not. What research has shown is that when you do crunches explosively, <laughs> like that, and not only maximizes the ab involvement, but it also maximizes the oblique involvement. And so the crunch, which is typically regarded as an upper ab exercise, now is both an ab and 
an oblique exercise. So you not only want to do slow and controlled uh, crunches, you also want to do some fast explosive crunches. And so for today's workout, like I said, we're doing three sets of 10. <laughs> And that's really the end of the workout, three sets of 10. Now, what I will say, instead of doing three sets of 10, we can end it here, you guys get the point, is that when you're doing crunches, not in this workout of the, my shortcut to strength, but when you're doing them in any, let's say my shortcut to size, or any other program, one tip that you can use with this fast explosive reps is to start your set with fast and explosive reps maybe eight to 10. Then once you start fatiguing and you can no longer maintain that explosive motion, now you can change into slow and controlled reps and finish out the set that way. That way you get those fast explosive reps at the beginning of the set when they're not fatigued. So you develop the most power, but then you also do those slower controlled reps to really work on the ab development. So I won't waste your time with three sets of 10 crunches. So if there's any more questions. Yeah, I would just say I'll let everyone there. know where they can find you on social media. And um, we will be choosing winners for the giveaway at the end. Of yeah, this oh event. yeah, let me mention. So post your comments, right? On, is it on the Facebook? Yep. Right, on the bodybuilding.com Facebook page. And we'll be going through, we've got, uh, I believe it's chocolate cookie crunch and cookies and cream to the new legacy flavors to give to you guys for free. So uh, good luck uh, to you guys who are hoping to get one of those jugs uh, of protein powder. And uh, like I said, social media, you can find me, Facebook, Jim Stepani, Twitter at Jim Stepani, Instagram, all at Jim Stepani. I'm pretty easy to find. All right, guys. Appreciate you uh, hanging out and training with me. And uh, check back here at bodybuilding.com for more live sessions from me.